okay, we're going to now man an assembly plant. And so the question is, how would you go about doing that? So we're kind of going to walk through at a high level of how we would do that. So we have a new product launch. Let's assume that this is a new, brand new built plant. So how, what should our target be for manpower? That's a good question. And how would we do that? So remember this, tack time level rate at which the customer pulls production to the plant, the metronome. That's where we begin, because we have to know what does the customer want per year? What are we forecasting? Typically over the life of the product, usually a new model launch lasts three years before it's either updated or completely replaced. So we have a new product and we're forecasting over the next three years a level demand, meaning that once we set this plan up, we do not want to change the line speed, if at all possible, because it's just a nightmare, nightmare to change line speed. So we manipulate that level balance schedule <clears throat> by incentives to the customer and rebates, line, shutting down the plant for several weeks, working Saturdays, possibly even going to third shift. So we have a lot of different ways in which we can maintain that line speed. But we make as accurate a forecast as we can about what the customer is going to want over the next three years for this product that we're launching so that we can set this whole facility up based upon that and then not change it. Because the car is on a moving chain. It's not like a work cell where you have flexibility to volume. It, the volume flexibility is not easy. It's not something that you can just adjust day to day or week to week. So we start out with this tack rate that we uh, predict. And of course, that defines perfect balance and even flow of products. Um, tack time minutes of work per day, units desired by the customer per day. So we're going to say we're going to work 912 uh, minutes a day. We're going to say it's a two-shift operation. So that's typically what they'll set a plan up. Ob obviously, they want to utilize this space and use two shifts to run it. They've got a third shift if they need it. And they can retract to a first shift. So does that make sense? I'm setting up right in the middle of my capability. I have room to move one direction or the other, worst case. So we're going to say the units desired per year are 200,000. There's 250 workdays. 800 units a day are what we're going to produce. That's based on our market research. This is a car we're building. We believe that we can support this kind of volume. So in this case, our tack time is 68.4 seconds, which is the rate at which customers put in cars on the truck. Is that the rate we're going to run the line? Are we going to run the, the speed of the line? Remember, this is a unique situation. That's why I want to talk about assembly plants. Because the work isn't paced by people. It's paced by a chain pulling the car through at a steady rate. So do we want the chain to be pulling the car through the assembly plant at 68.4 seconds? No. And why? We could plan for something things could go wrong. Yeah, and I think for the sake of understanding, we're going to call that OEE. Because typically, that's what drives it all. So OEE, we've got to account for what is the difference between perfection, which is setting this plan up at 68.4 seconds, and problems, things that go wrong, which we're just going to call OEE for the sake of argument. Could be other things, but it's typically based around that. So if we were on a one-shift operation, we'd have to run a speed at 34.2 seconds. That'd take a lot more people, right? A lot more processes. You don't have as much time to put the car together, so you're going to have to have double the manpower, double the processes. So what should the cycle time or line speed be? There's the, uh, let me go back one too quick. Cycle time equals tack time minus allowance. We're going to say it's OEE. Um, Allowance is over speed, over speed is waste. So obviously if you want to reduce waste, you slow down, right? Rebalance. So what is Taichi Ono's number one waste of the seven? Overproduction, drives everything. So this is just a uh, review here. <clears throat> Availability, 800 divided by 912 minutes. We're gonna say 87.7, performance 93.8, quality 95.2, overall equipment effectiveness in our case is 78.4. We're gonna say that's our capability. So the benchmark OE for industry average, because we should always be looking at the benchmark, right? We're a competitive business. We live and die by being competitive. If we don't task ourselves to be competitive, we could disappear. So if the benchmark for the industry is 80.4, uh, planned OE improvement to meet industry average of 2%, so we need 19.6% overspeed. 19.6% is waste, right? Just pure waste. We've acknowledged it. We know that we're not perfect. We know that we have to build in this amount of waste in our assembly plant. So you see how vitally important it is OEE, driving that metric. <clears throat> so 80.4 of 68.5 is 55 seconds. So we're going to set our line speed at 55 seconds in this example. So now what? So we, now what is, what are our targets for the processes? That, how many processes should we have? Should we have the number of processes that the car dictates, or should we task ourselves to do something different? We're a competitive company, right? Can we just do whatever we need? Can we just set our plan up however we like? Oh, this car's kind of complicated. Looks like we're going to need this many processes to be able to build it. But you've got to pay for that. And typically, you pay more for that than you do it yourself. And we talked about that last time. So why would we outsource if we're better than the outsourcing company? That's a good point. That's possible, yes. Well, you can outsource putting the car together, though. You can outsource components. But that's a good strategy because you might say, how do we get the number down? 
how do we be competitive? Of course, when you look at the number of what other companies are producing at, you got to understand what they've outsourced, right? So if you find out, oh, they can build a car with this many processes, now you have to go through the analysis and say, wow, half of the things that they put in the car are outsourced. You have to factor that in because there's a cost related to it. So direct labor manpower targets. Uh, so benchmark, 18 and a half hours of direct labor to build one unit. So what is that benchmark? If you recall, remember we talked about the Harbor Report? Harbor Report is an industry standard where they measure every vehicle built in every place in every country. And they tell you, here is what it takes to build a Nissan Sentra, 18 and a half hours of direct labor. So since you know what that number is, the benchmark for the same assembly plant is what you want to target. And we say that the benchmark for that assembly plant is eight and a half, 18 and a half hours, meaning we're going to build this vehicle and this car that is very, very similar in size and shape and content is 18 and a half hours. So we know that it doesn't matter how much it takes to build this car. What really matters is can we even stay in business? So we have got to target manpower based upon a competitive number that our, that our competition is building this car at. That's going to dictate how many processes we have, not what it takes. Uh, so do you think it's important when we design the vehicle that we think about these things? See how critical the design of the vehicle is? Because you know when this thing hits the floor, when you throw it over the wall and say, now build it, you've got to have a product that's designed in such a way that you can be competitive on your labor or you're not going to make it. So it's 18 and a half hours to build one unit. And then what should we do? Should we task, should we task that a little bit? This is what management people do. <laughs> they say, okay, if the best is 18 and a half, and this is a brand new plant, it's a brand new plant. We're, we're taking a second shot at this. They've already put that in place and that's their current manpower. We kind of think that we should be able to improve upon the benchmark a bit. So we're gonna give you a task. So you're the industrial engineers for building this new plant. So we're gonna give you a task. We're gonna say, you gotta build this car with 18 hours of direct labor so that we can be competitive. So we'll say, uh, we'll say the first three rows are assembly. We'll say the next two rows are paint and the last two rows are body. And this is the team, and this is your job. So how, ma how much labor do you get for assembly? Meaning how many processes do you have to set up? So 18 hours, there's the seconds, uh, 400 units per shift is 18 hours, and then, and then, okay, 900 people per shift, 900 direct labor processes. Do we need 1,800 for two shifts? No, because we're defining processes. People just come in and they get on the process on the next shift. So we need, we need 900 direct labor processes in that plant actual workstations that do something for us to be competitive. That's our target. So how many do you get assembly? This is your task. So this is a typical ratio. So we're going to tell assembly, you get 612 processes. Maybe we should go back three rows, maybe four rows. Yeah, we'll go four rows. Four rows is assembly. One row paint, one row body. Paint shop gets 108. Body shop gets, a, or I'm sorry, body shop gets 108 and paint shop it's 180. So now you have a task, the first four rows. You have 612 direct labor processes that you've got to set up and define for the engineering requirements and standards. Setting up the proper sequence and all the requirements and defining all the work. So there's a launch team typically. Typically this is how a launch team is made up. You have design engineering. Of course, we just mentioned they have a significant impact on hours per vehicle. And this starts about three years, four years prior to the car actually going into production. So they're developing design early on. You have production control. These are the material and logistics people. You have salary and hourly teams from body paint and assembly that work process that have been, we pick out some of the better people we have in those organizations and we send them off to the launch team to work with the engineering group three years prior to launch. And then design and process requirements are defined and manpower targets are defined that we just did. So you got this complete launch team and you're the industrial engineering piece of that. So obviously we need to understand the seven ways so we can classify labor. Define all elements of non-value added and value added for each process. This is critically important when you look at the process for doing this and how we improve. <laughs> Determine time for each element. Utilize movable wall chips for line balancing, and we'll talk about what that is. And create visual line balance wall for each logical work team. Logical work teams, I'm talking about the people that put the car together. So you may have teams of 10 to 12 employees. Every 10 to 12 stations, there's a team with a team leader. And they know what the line balance is for their area because they're going to help. Seven ways, just a reminder. So determine the elements of time. I say time studies, this is my belief. Time studies are prone to error, may not take into account training curve. Operators may be able to gain the IE. So there's a lot of variation in my opinion with time standards using watch. And that may be what you have available to you because the organization doesn't necessarily use predetermined time standards, but uh, the consequence of incorrect analysis is so significant. If, if you make error when you're taking the time using the watch and you don't assess properly, it's, it can be catastrophic, especially if the organization trusts you and you're wrong. 
Uh, predetermined time and motion standards are best. Mode apps is used by Ford and accepted by the UAW. Most, I'm sure you're familiar, Maynard operating sequence technique. These are both predetermined time standard methods. I would highly recommend that you use these. When we go down to our lab, uh, everybody tells us that they can complete the job in 60 seconds, but then when we run, they can't. And a lot of that, a lot of the reasoning for that is there's a training curve. It takes quite a while and a lot of work to, for people to get up to speed. If you're timing somebody on the job, you may say, I think that we need this many seconds to do the job based upon my observations. But the problem is the observation's not legitimate because a person's not capable and they haven't trained enough. And you may set a standard for the organization off of that observation, which is incorrect. So why worry about it? Why not just take the elements of movement and just use predetermined standards to check the time? Already well developed. Already has training curve factored in. <clears throat> so here's a wall chip. Wall chip tells us this is operation 986 and here's all the things that they do and here's non-value added elements that are in yellow. Here's option content on one of the elements. Uh, now notice at the top, notice at the top that you have a 55 second line cycle time, 68.4 second tack time. So how efficient is this process? It's relative, obviously, but relatively close to the 55 seconds, but quite a ways away from the tack rate. But of course you can't exceed, you can't load this job up towards 68.4 seconds because the car is gonna go by the person because the car is moving every 55. But just for the sake of reference, the customer wants it every 68.4. Wall chips are sized in proportion to the time, two seconds of work for every inch. The chips are two and a quarter inches wide. So we can see, relatively speaking, how much time it takes for each element, element just visually. Chips are color-coded. Green chips are used for work, and yellow chips are used for waste or opportunity for improvement. Chips are magnetic and movable. So if you have this magnetic wall, and you have all these chips on the jobs, let's say 12 jobs, and you can see how they relate to the line speed, you can start analyzing where these elements of work can go. Of course, considering sequence. So you understand where you, what your efficiency or utilization, which we'll talk about, is of a certain area. So that's waste, right? I keep emphasizing. Accepted waste. Okay, so uh, Yamazumi process, that's what it's referred to, is having the line speed of the line and having the jobs laid out in a certain area for a team, for the whole assembly plan, however you want to do it, which really shows, relatively speaking, how well you're utilizing labor in terms of value added and how well you're creating efficiency towards the 55 seconds. So obviously you want to reduce the waste, walk time, wait time, and you want to remove it and you want to balance. This would be ideal, obviously. I mean, you look at the time it actually takes for this job in the transition to perfection. Of course, you won't get to perfection, but I guess we could get halfway there or three quarters of the way there. And that's an example of a Yamazumi wall, visual and portable. Okay, now let's talk about tack time and line cycle time a little bit more. <clears throat> so tack time is based on demand and used to determine line cycle time. We know that line cycle time is tack time minus overspeed derived from OEE. Uh, overspeed reduces cycle time, increasing the operations required. So in this particular example, if we were able to slow the line down to the customer demand, if we were able to do that, we would need two operators. If we have to take into account the OEE, which we do, we will need three operators. So think across your, uh, what did we say, how many jobs we have to process, 900 in assembly, what effect that would have. So again, that's waste. So let's talk about these two terms, target efficiency and utilization. Target efficiency, let's say at 95%, is line cycle time times 95%. So that's a simple one. We want to take the total time it takes to produce this job and multiply it times 95% to say this is what we would expect our target to be for efficiency when we're setting up our operation. Because remember, you have a task now. Assembly has 90, 900 jobs. What do you think you need to target in terms of efficiency and or utilization for each operation in summation to achieve your target? How wasteful can you be in setting the process up? What can you get away with? So target utilization is a line cycle times times 70%. So what's the difference between the two? Any, any guesses? And which one would you rather target? So of course our efficiency is 52, utilization 39. Um, I think we have it here. This is the difference between the two. Operations required at 95% efficiency are four. Operations required at 70% utilization are three. Utilization only considers value added work. And efficiency considers all time taken. Wait time, idle time, non-value added work. In other words, what does the operator have available to them? How much time does it take them to actually complete the process? <clears throat> so which target's better for you? Utilization at 70% is better to task your group at rather than efficiency at 
So the question is what behaviors are driven by utilization and efficiency? Efficiency drives the elimination of labor by combining both value-added and non-value-added work. So if you want to meet your targets, you just simply have to meet an efficiency goal. You don't have to care about waste because waste actually can help you. If you time the job and you say it takes this long, wait, walk time, wait time, all elements of that stack bar, and you say we want our organization to be 95% efficient, then there's no concern on the team to drive the non-value-added work out because actually the non-value-added work works to your benefit because you're trying to improve efficiency. You have no regard for it. Utilization, on the other hand, is driving the elimination of waste because you cannot possibly achieve your goal if you don't attack waste. Does that make sense? If my focus is my value-added work alone, and that is what helps me achieve target, then I have to, I have to focus on the non-value-added work and then resequence jobs or move elements around. But I have to, as an organization, be driven to remove walk time, wait time, and all the other elements of waste and not be, too, not be concerned, actually, so much with the uh, value-added portion of it. So you have an organization that's trying to remove waste in order to achieve their target. Wow, that's good. That will help you. So the line balancing system, just a couple examples. And we see, we see tack time and we see cycle time. Here are four jobs. You see the relative weight of non-value-added to value-added. In the first example, that's too much weight or idle time. In the second example, you have overburden and unevenness. Too much waste. Look at the yellow. See, in that particular example, you could have a pretty, you might meet your objective on efficiency because you're considering both elements for efficiency target. But you would be sorely missing your utilization target. So again, if we don't measure utilization and value added alone, you may have an organization that doesn't care about getting rid of waste because they're meeting their objectives. I shouldn't say don't care. Certainly not motivated for it. And here's a good example of a balanced process. You see how closely related all these jobs are. In your, uh, in your uh, cells, in Tiger Motors, are those balanced, in your opinion, your jobs? Yeah. So we had this discussion. We had this discussion with the groups. How do you know that? Some people have a lot of idle time. Why is that? Yeah. What? Why is there a bottleneck? This is a good discussion. This is a good point here, I think. We, I think we've looked at these, have we not? Did we not use predetermined time standards to set it up? Okay, so your TAs are saying these are balanced. You're saying they're not balanced. So, okay, so you have bottlenecks. Why do you have bottlenecks? Oh, who said that? Lack of training. Does that have anything to do with the job capability? It actually doesn't. It's unrelated. It's not part of the data. You as a team of industrial engineers with your 900 process budget, are you going to be concerned with the training part of it, or are you just going to be concerned with the capability of the system? Isn't that somebody else's problem to train employees? That's not part of the architecture of the job. That's not part of the setup. That's not part of the time standard, right? So what I'm saying, this is a really important point. I've seen this. I had industrial engineers work for me, and new industrial engineers work for me. And I'm telling you, this is a common problem. They see what is going on in the process. They see the failure of some people, and they jump to the conclusion that the job is not set up properly. The managers do it also. They have trouble. They're wringing their hands, line stopping. They have to put extra people on a job. And the first default response is, I think this job's screwed up. Well, what would tell us different? What should we look at to understand whether this job is adequate or not adequate? Doable or not doable? There you go. All right, now, time studies. There's the data, right? The data tells us whether it's doable or not. If, I'm going to say, if you say, let's say uh, you did a time study. Nobody can do the job. You say that, I tell you, I'm your manager. It's not, it's not the job. I'm sorry, your name? Jake. Jake. Jake did a good job. He's done the time study. It says it's doable. I've had this conversation many times. And you say, I don't care what Jake did. Nobody can do this job. I think Jake's time standard is not, not appropriate. I don't think he did it right. Look at what people are doing. Nobody can keep up. What do we do? You might have to re-study. Might have to re-study. So do, do, I want, do I want somebody to go out there and take a stopwatch and check it, or do I want to use predetermined time standards? Or do I want to use both? Do I want to check it that way? Yes. One of the weaknesses I saw in predetermined time studies, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, was that it doesn't take into account new factors. Um, for instance, like there's one, or there's several, there's several uh, things like Lego Lab where you have two parts that are mirror images of each other, and they are consistently put in the wrong bins. So if you grab one, so you think you're getting one for the right hand side, you bring it down, you go, oh crap, that was, you know. Yeah, no, no that, that's a good point. I, 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 would, I think there's an assumption that those things are considered when you set the operation up. And so if they're not set up well or make it easy for people to do the work, I don't know that they can get into that level of detail. I'm not a predetermined time standard expert, but. Yeah, that, that's, 
that's right. That's another problem that people have to deal with. It's separate from the time standard. The time standard says, given people do this properly, how long does it take? And and so would that still be a problem? Would that still be would that still be a problem with a stopwatch? Yeah. Wouldn't matter either way you do it. You're still going to have that issue. So this is a critically important thing. I'm telling you, this is so critical. I've had so many people do this. I'm going to tell my story. I don't know. Did I? You know, I'm getting old. I may have told this story. Did I tell you about? I know I told some of you this about the guy putting deck lid weather strips on. I didn't tell you this. Okay, I'll tell you the deck lid weather strip story. This is perfect. So uh, guy, he's, this is a tough job, and it's a little bit of an ergo job because you're pressing a seal all the way around the deck lid. And by the way, nobody likes this job. Nobody wants to do this job. It's not a great job. So the guy can't keep up. So what do you do? Do you stop the line all day, every other cycle, stop the line? No, you put somebody with this person while they're training. And hopefully they will adapt. So this person has been on the job about a week. So that means this person has completed 2,500 cycles. Still can't do the job. All right, so we got to do something. Now, I might be cynical and I might think, this guy hates this job and he wants us to put, us, put him somewhere else. Right? And this is on first shift. So is there anything I might want to compare this guy to? How about second shift? Second shift. Are you having any trouble with this job? Nah, no problem at all. Yeah, okay, well maybe, maybe you have this exceptional person on second shift that's done this for five years. So maybe there's a little something to this. But I'm start, that's a red flag. They don't have an issue, right? So I have the IE come out and say, double check this job for me and check the time elements on it and tell me what you think. Industrial engineer says, it's doable. And by the way, industrial engineers always say that. They, they, they justify it no matter what. They're never gonna say, hey, if they say, I don't think this job's doable, guess what, they've got a lot of work, right? So they always, I know what he's going to say before he says it. Oh, it is doable. Okay, good. Thanks for confirming. All right. So then I tell the supervisor, this job's doable. And I said, I, I want you be, at the end of the shift, bring that guy in the office and give him a written verbal warning for performance. And he said, well, you know, we could move him somewhere else. I go, no, 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 no. Don't start that or you'll be moving everybody. Don't even do that because now you're telling people, hey, if you can't do a job, we'll find another one for you. Don't do it. So he gives him a written verbal warning. Next day he comes in, can't do the job. So I said, write him up. This is a step process. So he writes him up. This is a written warning, not a written verbal warning. There's all these steps. So he comes in the next day, we give him a day off. Can't do it. He comes in the next day, can't do it, we give him three days off. So next step is he's fired. And what we will say is, he's not adaptable to the work. It's not him. He's not adaptable. He can't work here. He's not capable. This is a doable job. Employee can't do it. He comes in the next day, no problem. Does it, doesn't miss a beat, never misses again. So what happened there? This is a person who took it right to the edge. I'm going to test this as far as I can. I went off this damn job. I hate it. I'll go as far as I have to, to see if I can get up. I've got my union steward fighting for me, telling, telling me I'm being unreasonable. I'm gonna push this as far as I can. Once the person knew I can go no further, magically they could keep up every day. Now, if an IE, if you went out and watched this person, there's, he's perspiring, he's got weather strips hanging over his shoulder, he's chasing cars, he's stumbling, and you're gonna think this job's not doable. And your stopwatch is gonna say it's not doable because you're not gonna consider it's, there's other issues, you're gonna miss it. He's going to game you and make you think that he can't, and it's gonna be hard to dispute from what you're observing. But if you do the predetermined time standard, it might say doable. And then, as a leader, you have to do what you have to do. Otherwise, you'd have chaos. If you have doable jobs, and people don't do them, at some point, something's gotta give. You can't, you can't give into that. But that's my point about how critical this is. And that's why I say when you're in Tiger Motors and you say, oh, we've got an unbalanced line, we need to redistrib redistribute the work, maybe you don't, maybe the work's fine, maybe it's balanced perfectly. You may have somebody who's not adapting well, for whatever reason. So imagine the work involved with redistributing the work. Oh my God, that is very difficult to do. You think in an assembly plant, I have to go to a job, I've got to take elements of work off that job and redistribute them to other jobs in the, in the line. Based upon BS, that's a lot of effort for a lot of people to endure. And on this particular job, I may take one or two elements off. Where are they going? They're going to somebody else. I'm gonna come up to another employee and say, hey, by the way, Samrat, eh. Yeah, you know, it looks like I noticed you're reading the newspaper between cycles. That's how non-IE do IE work, by the way. I, I noticed you're reading a newspaper between cycles. Um, you think you have time to put this body plug in for us? And what are you going to say? No. What, are you out of your mind? No way I can keep up. Now you've got to fight this battle. Now we're going to assign an element of work to him because this person says they can't do it. Doesn't matter what the data says. I'm just going to respond to what I'm viewing. I'm not going to be driven by data. So hence my recommendation to use predetermined time standards, if at all possible. You can defend those. They're, it's a standard. The world accepts that standard. Ford Motor Company uses that standard. You don't have to get into an argument about, I don't know that I really taken into consideration all the elements I should have or the training curve. You don't have to worry about that. Uh-oh, it's getting late, isn't it? Um, okay. So balance with one operation to distribute, balance with one operation distributed, just a couple examples. So we want to reduce overspeed, right? 
We want to slow the line down, don't we, ultimately, by reducing OEE. So here's a good point I want you to see. Given our example, 19.6% overspeed and assuming an efficiency of 85%, our plant requires 34.4 direct labor operations over perfection, 34.4%. That's 309 extra people for the assembly plant based on those calculations. Boy, that's significant. There's some opportunity. So of course, what we do is go through the process with the Yamazumi and we look at it and we try to balance these operations. We try to reduce the, the non-value added work and we try to consolidate this work and remove the labor that's not required. Should look something more like this instead of like this. That's significant. That's the difference between in business and out of business. And IEs have an awful lot to do with that. So we want to improve the OEE, slow line speed down, cycle time accordingly, rebalance all operations. And we want to do this, right? We're always looking to do this. You've seen this quite often, but what is this? In our example, that's 309 extra employees. Quiz, 